Hi, I'm Phil Albertelli, and this is The Week in Doubt, a podcast for atheists, agnostics, and whoever, and this is episode 154. Okay, so I have absolutely no idea what I'm going to talk about this week. This episode is going to be completely unscripted and drinking rum and coke. So get ready, anything could happen, I guess. So maybe I'll start with some inside baseball. And yes, I understand the irony of me using a sports analogy. So since the start of the show, it's been a never-ending quest to try to increase the sound quality. I'm basically one guy recording this show with the aid of a USB mic, a Mac Mini, GarageBand, and an Asus monitor I use for uh, graphic design. And even though I have uh, some experience with recording from uh, being a musician, I'll, I use that term loosely given all I really ever did was sing and write lyrics, but I did mess around with the guitar and come up with some of the uh, riffs for some of our tunes too. So I had like a, a modest understanding of recording just due to my music experience. But using GarageBand, splicing and editing, you know, putting a a whole podcast together, that's been a learning experience. And it's kind of painful to listen to some of the older episodes where my editing skills were still lacking. And I would kind of cut in between two sentences and then I would overlap the two bits, and sometimes the whole ends of sentences would get chopped off or the ends of words. So I'm a little better with uh, with that. But one thing that I still obsess about, or actually that I just started obsessing about recently, is unwanted breathing noises. And it's become like my white whale. And the funny thing is, I realized they've kind of been there all along, but I just didn't notice them till recently. In between sentences, you know, you can hear my annoying inhales. So now I've become obsessed with getting rid of those, and now I'm starting to notice them in other people's podcasts. And it kind of reminds me of the guy from Edgar Allan Poe's uh, A Telltale Heart where, you know, uh, the guy murders someone, you know, it's pretty morbid and gruesome like most of Poe's stories. Uh, He murders someone and buries them beneath the floorboards and he can hear the heart, uh, you know, beating louder and louder. Now I've become obsessed with the sound of breathing noises and I hear them everywhere. Uh, But to try to mitigate that, I actually ordered yesterday and had it delivered overnight, I'm using it right now, uh, something called a pop filter. And if you're not familiar, a pop filter is one of those round screens, kind of uh, blackish, and uh, the screen is almost like a nylon material that you'll see in front of microphones and recording studios or whatever. And uh, they're mainly to get rid of what they call, uh, I think it's plosive, like the plosive P's and the like hard S sounds. Uh, P's and S's really tend to kind of plague recording artists and and, uh, studio engineers or whatever. For some reason, those have never been my problem. Uh, it's mostly just been the breathing noises. It's supposed to take care of those as well, but I'm already noticing that they're still there to some degree. So I guess the only solution for now is to just suck it up and do really thorough editing and try to cut those noises out where I can without um, making the, uh, the finished product sound unnatural. And I actually have a good friend that I've known for a really long time, since high school, who's a professional uh, DJ, not like a disc jockey at parties or whatever, I mean an on-air personality at radio stations, and uh, they're also a voiceover artist. I won't give her name on the air since she is a public figure, and I don't know if she wants the... uh, added headache of being uh, associated with an atheist podcast so but uh she's kind of a self-styled uh recording or engineering geek and uh, i wouldn't use that word for her not at all but she seems to use that word herself i think it's just her way of joking around about how much um she loves the technical aspect of recording so i asked her to listen to uh some of the recent episodes and see if she could identify any ways in which I could improve the, uh, the the overall sound of the podcast. And she didn't pull any punches right away. She said, it sounds like you're in a tunnel. 
<laughs> and she was like, none of the settings or, you know, software or whatever is going to change that. You need better hardware. And she suggested that I get like a kind of more traditional uh, condenser mic, one that's not a USB. Uh, she was saying that USBs don't pick up all the desired frequencies that you're... Uh, traditional or conventional microphones do. And she also suggested getting a mixing board. And also uh, she suggested as far as software goes to give uh, a Adobe Audition a try. I'm using GarageBand right now. So it, it was a lot to think about. And uh, I really appreciated her effort. And I was getting ready to pull the trigger and buy the mic she suggested, as well as a mixing board. And then while well, looking on Amazon, I ran across the mic I'm using now, and I forgot that the USB mic I'm using now costs like $130. It's a, a Blue Yeti. <laughs> That's kind of a funny name. It's a, a Blue Yeti USB mic. I guess technically it's a condenser mic. And as far as USB mics go, it, it's... It's really reputable, and I think on Amazon it has something like four or five stars, so, uh, and pretty much rave reviews almost across the board. And I don't know if she's listening, uh, but if you are listening, uh, hopefully I didn't offend you, because she took all this time to look at some of my files and to make all these suggestions, and we were exchanging files via uh, Dropbox. Now, my brother wants me to design a website for the family construction company, and I had to quickly make room for, like, a gigabyte of uh, remodeling pictures. So I had to delete some of the files I shared with her, or rather, you know, pull them back out into my desktop. So I sent her a message, and I'm like, oh, yeah, thanks for everything. Uh, I didn't want you to be perplexed if you looked in our Dropbox folders. <laughs> I had to clear a bunch of room to make room for some of my brother's files. And, um... I also told her I, I was still thinking about the gear and I might keep using my mic for a while just because of how much it cost me. So hopefully she didn't take any of that the wrong way. Uh, she's an awesome person and I appreciate the help. And she's given me a lot to think about. And probably at some point down the road, I will take her advice and see if I can um, jack the quality of the show up a bit by uh, buying some of the gear she suggested. Then actually, I have another acquaintance. Um, I, I would call him a friend, but I don't see him that often, that I know through one of the guitarists in my band. And I think he went to school for cinematography, but he works in the news business now, I think. And so he does like engineering, recording, video, uh, videography and stuff. Is that a, a real word? Videography? Is that, <laughs> is that how you say it? Um, but he does all that stuff for a living. And my guitarist asked him on my behalf if the setup that I had was all right, would a mixing board and all this stuff be overkill? And he thought it might be overkill because at the end of the day, everything's still going to get so compressed by the time you're done and, and you, you know, you've put it into an MP3 or M4V file format that, uh, you know, a, a, a decent USB mic and garage band might do the trick. But hopefully I'm not boring you guys with all this technical stuff. It's probably not too technical, but it seems technical to me. But the never-ending uh, battle to increase the quality of the show continues. And who knows, maybe if someday, you know, if the, if the show keeps on growing and I get enough uh, Patreon supporters or PayPal donators or whatever, uh, I might start experimenting by buying more professional gear and seeing what it does for the overall sound quality of the show. In fairness to my friend, who's a, a radio personality and voiceover uh, artist that I mentioned, I've listened to some of her professional work, uh, some spots or commercials, or, or, or one, actually one, um, that she did from her home studio, and the quality is absolutely amazing. It sounds as professional as can be. And I'm talking about spots that are actually going to go on the radio. Um, so she's obviously doing something right. So uh, she probably is on to something with the advice she's given me. Uh, and even if it is so, I mean, it might seem like so-called overkill to some people, but if it gives me the same quality that she's producing, and I, and I could give that quality to you guys every episode, that, that would be pretty cool. 
But anyway, that's probably enough about that. So it just came to me that there were a couple of things I wanted to talk about. One is a serious news story that's been kind of haunting me all week. And the other is, is kind of a fun little correction or clarification. Uh, maybe I'll take care of that first. So I think during last week's episode, when I was talking about the infamous Dr. Kellogg and his kind of quack prescriptions for uh, trying to tamp down uh, sexuality, and uh, in passing, I kind of talked about Victorian prudishness or whatever. And, and one of the things I talked about specifically was the supposed habit of Victorians covering furniture legs because they thought the legs resembled female legs and were kind of a show of immodesty. And if they weren't covered up, they might actually sexually excite people or something like that. And I think, to my credit, I actually did say that I didn't know if it was simply an old wives' tale, you know, because it's so strange. Uh, but at the same time, I thought I had heard it from a couple of reputable sources, maybe uh, documentaries or something like that. Well, a uh, friend of the show, Buzzwigs, uh, it's been so long since I, I've heard from him that I, I, it pains me to say it, but I almost forgot about him. I think Buzzwigs is one of the first people to really interact with me on the Weekend Out Facebook page. He definitely goes into the, uh, the honored pantheon of uh, <laughs> Weekend Out listeners, along with the, the likes of uh, Russ Ray and uh, Crocoduck. And uh, hopefully I'm not stepping on anyone's feelings by neglecting to uh, mention you. And of course, there's some people who interact with me regularly who wish to remain anonymous. But uh, Buzzwigs is a great guy, and I've always loved his profile pic. It's like a kitten wearing like a, a leather or vinyl jacket, and it's kind of working a couple of turntables. <laughs> um, and here's what Buzzwigs said to me. Granted, Stitch... Yeah, and he did. I was waiting. I was waiting to see if someone would would take the bait and, and call me Stitch. And uh, if you're wondering where the nickname Stitch comes from, uh, just listen to episode 153, where I tell the embarrassing tale of my uh, adult circumcision. But anyway, uh, I'll start over. Buzzwig says, Granted, Stitch, Dr. Kellogg is to human sexuality what Mike Huckabee is to politics or journalism. Be that as it may, I think, I think you owe the Victorians an apology. Much maligned and misunderstood, I would encourage them to form an anti-defamation league, but tragically they are all dead. I wonder if there's like one Victorian left somewhere. Is there like... Uh, maybe like a 119-year-old kicking around somewhere. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, and, and then he provided me with a link to uh, a podcast by someone named uh, Professor Buzzkill, probably not his Christian name, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, and that was pretty good. It's just a guy who kind of tears down modern uh, myths and uh, common misconceptions and I uh, replied back enthusiastically, Buzzy's back. Good to hear from you. And you're still rocking the DJ cat. I'm going to check out this link now, although I'm a little afraid because I have the feeling it's going to prove me wrong about something. And you guys are probably familiar with the website Snopes that kind of busts all sorts of uh, myths, urban legends, uh, common misconceptions, etc. Well, funny enough, it doesn't look like Snopes directly takes on this myth, but there was a very interesting thread about it uh, on Snopes entitled Victorians and Naughty Table Legs. And so someone named, uh, it looks like Rebo-chan, <laughs> Um, so on another board, somebody mentioned the old chestnut that people in Victorian England were so uptight that they covered table legs to keep even the furniture from appearing immodest. I know this is an urban legend, but I wanted to point them at something like an article here. I can't seem to find one on the main site, and Google is not being my friend. Am I just hallucinating? And someone else replies, uh, someone simply named Steve, 
I don't know if there was ever an article here that covered the legend. Jack Lynch discusses it in his book, The Lexicographer's Dilemma. According to him, the only known contemporary evidence for the phenomenon of dressing up piano legs, or rather limbs, is Diary in America, an 1839 book by an English writer, Frederick Marriott. Marriott claimed that in his travels in the Niagara Falls area, he entered a ladies' seminary where he saw a piano with its limbs and frilly trousers, even if Marriott's account is to be believed. It appears that covering up naked furniture was a weird habit of a single seminary rather than a fashion of the times. And there's a lot of interesting stuff here, at least I find it interesting, and hopefully you guys will too. Uh, someone else commented, I was going to say the nearest I've read to this was in Martin Chuzzlewit, 1843-44, in which Dickens makes fun of Americans. While Martin and Mark Tapley are visiting America, Mark uses the phrase, with the naked eye, which causes shock because the word naked is far too vulgar to be mentioned in what passes for polite company in the USA. Dickens was writing satire, but presumably it was based on his own experience in the States. So again, it wouldn't have been an English, but an American thing. Funny that it's since been applied to our side of the Atlantic. And then, uh, and then someone named Barbrainy with a beagle for an avatar says, I once read about this myth more than 36 years ago in a book on the quote-unquote new morality which compared the morals of the 1950s to the Victorian age. This was largely because Hugh Hefner did so. I believed it then, but recently I began to doubt it. The History Channel, a cable TV channel here in the U.S., and I, I know they have the uh, History uh, Channel in the U.K. too, but anyway, had a series entitled The History of Sex, and I actually remember that, and I think it was uh, narrated by, I can't believe I forget the woman's name, she was the female love interest from Romancing the Stone. I'm trying to think. She had like a smoky voice. Uh, Kathleen Turner. Kathleen Turner. Um, in the episode on Victorianism, it showed a piano with what looked more like a skirt covering the legs halfway down. This was not quote-unquote trousers. It may be that only one lady put such a skirt on her piano, but this action caused people in later generations to believe that all Victorians did it. Someone else says, um, I recall a segment of the BBC show, QI, which dealt with the myth. Um, I think they speculated that if anybody did cover up on seemly furniture limbs, it was most likely, or it was likely to protect against or cover up dirt and damage or to hide repair work to an otherwise grand social statement piece. Then someone named JT says, uh, quote unquote, Victorian dad. I've never heard of that. Victorian dad, is that like American dad? Victorian dad from Viz frequently had issues with uncovered table legs. Before administering his family's daily beating and heading off to church for three hours of hypocrisy and sub-zero temperatures, in fact a piss take on Puritanism, Victorian dad was so entitled to tie in with popular myth, that of the Victorian era being puritanical, when in fact it was largely acknowledged as being far from it. Then someone with the cool uh, alias Azure Lion or Handel says, For that matter, photographs of Victorian interiors are not hard to find. I have a number of books of these, and a cursory glance reveals lots of immodest tables. Even where table coverings are used, I have seen few examples where the tablecloth goes all the way down to the floor, so nothing was really being covered up. If this was at all widespread, there ought to be more photographic evidence of it. Then <laughs> someone kind of cheekily replies, obviously you have <laughs> obviously you have uncovered furniture pornography from the era. Then there's actually also an article from The Guardian. Um, let's see. And it looks like it's in a section, uh, notes and queries, or it's entitled Yesteryear. It is said that the Victorians prudishly covered table legs to avoid causing offense. My grandmother, born during Queen Victoria's reign, always maintained that bulbous table legs were covered purely to protect them from being chipped or scratched. Was she right? And someone says, both are right. The prudish Victorians would find the legs offensive and kick them. And uh, they're quoting Richard Owens, London, SW19. And then it says something about how in 1861... Not Dickens, it looks like, but a writer in Dickens magazine all the year round, probably Charles Collins, gave a review of a book on English customs by the French anarchist Flora Tristan. 
Tristan alleges the custom of modestly covering up the legs of furniture, but Collins makes fun of her statement, which evidently had no parallel in his experience. Some years earlier, however, Dickens himself had mentioned in Martin... Ch- uh, I think they butchered the name there, but the, the, the same story that uh, an earlier person mentioned. A related custom, which he apparently met with in America... That of treating the word leg as an obscenity, not to be uttered by or before ladies. Kipling found the same prejudice in Vermont 50 years later. And it looks like that's from Oliver Mundy, Redruth, uh, Comwall, UK. When will I learn not to try to uh, pronounce English place names? (laughs) Um, I think there's, let me see, I think there's one more. Then someone named Eve, and this is also, on, oh no, this is on uh, the boards at Straight Dope. And they uh, concur that they think it's an urban legend. I don't have the book on me, but last year I read a wonderful social history of Victorian times, and the author actually found the original site, which was a parody of overly prissy people. And that got taken up by later historians and reprinted as fact, not humor. The Victorians were much, much naughtier than posterity was have us believe. Yeah, so so the general consensus seems to be that, yes, um, this is most likely an urban legend. So luckily, I think I kind of hedge my bets by saying that uh, I thought it could possibly have been a uh, an old wives' tale or an urban legend. Um, but I will admit that uh, that I probably just have easily would have uh, believed it as well. So uh, I want to thank Buzzwigs for uh, keeping it real and actually for uh, leading me or spurring me into investigating this a little bit more. Uh, very cool. Okay, so on a much more serious note, I mentioned earlier a story that had been kind of haunting me. It's a story that broke this past week about that, uh, I'm at a, a loss for words, but that individual who killed nine people in a church uh, in Charleston, South Carolina. And uh, I know this might only seem like it vaguely has anything to do with religion, because it more on the surface seems like a straightforward hate crime, or I don't know if we would call it a spree killing uh, or whatever. I don't know if you can call it a spree killing if if it's so premeditated and the targets were so specific or whatever. I don't know, but uh, definitely a hate crime. Um, and there's a couple of different aspects I, I, I want to discuss about this story. But to me, it ties into religion in a couple of different ways. In, in a really superficial way, it ties in because obviously it happened at a church. And then on a deeper level, I, I think it kind of touches on the differences between how maybe a religious person responds to tragedies as opposed to maybe maybe how a secular person might react to a, a tragedy. And I'll get into that in a little bit, but I'll just read the opening paragraph from a from a Huffington Post story that broke today. And uh, this is Saturday, June 20th, as I'm reading this, and and this story is from uh, this Saturday. And it opens with, A website surfaced on Saturday containing a possible trove of photos of Dylan Roof. And I almost didn't mention his name, but I did. And a racist manifesto explaining why he allegedly targeted Charleston, South Carolina, in a shooting this week that killed nine African Americans. The website The Last Rhodesian, <laughs> I don't even know what that's about. You know, that's very strange, The Last Rhodesian. Um, and I, I was going to cast some kind of aspersion. I was going to guess, is this some kind of weird white separatist website that has something to do with racial strife in uh, South Africa, or something like that? I, I have no idea. Uh, but I actually just tried to open the site twice from two different devices, and maybe they took it down. Uh, But the first thing that dawned on me when I heard about this story and I saw the first picture that broke of the killer was, and this this will probably sound humorous or comedic, but in my mind, it it really wasn't. 
I, I remember I was filled with loathing and disdain for this guy, and I was kind of creeped out by how much, at first glance, he reminded me of the Sandy Hook killer because of his ridiculous bowl cut. Both guys had this kind of Mo from Three Stooges bowl cut, and... Uh, and whereas the Sandy Hook killer just looked totally out there, like blank face, you know, staring right through you, this guy looks more filled with hate. But they both look like they're in the same age group. If I remember correctly, I think this guy was 21 or something like that. And there's lots of kind of creepy but almost pathetic, laughable pictures of him. Where he looks like he's probably 90 pounds soaking wet or something like as scrawny as you can be, but he's trying to uh, kind of look macho for the camera. And there's pictures of him trying to look intimidating, uh, burning flags, trying to, you know, shoot daggers at the camera with his eyes. One where, you know, he's showing off his pipe cleaner arms and he's wearing a uh, gold gym shirt or whatever. And so whenever I hear about a story like this, I automatically, I don't know why, because I know better, I automatically assume that the person is going to be stupid or crazy. But actually, um, as is often the case, this guy, like many other loners who commit horrific acts, are often fairly intelligent. And I was kind of wondering, you know, if, if maybe like the Sandy Hook shooter, if this guy had some kind of weird form of autism or something like that. And I, I feel bad saying that because I don't want to... Uh, cast aspersions or um, or slander people with autism when obviously the, there's a wide spectrum of um, types of autism people have and, and degrees of it. And I don't think most autistic people are violent. It's actually probably quite the opposite. They might hurt, people with certain types of autism might hurt themselves and things like that, but they don't go off and commit murders. But I think, if I remember correctly, I, I think the Sandy Hook kid had some kind of autism. But like I said, the effects of different types of autism can vary greatly. You can have people that have types of autism and are functional and independent, like uh, Mark Zuckerberg, I think, has Asperger's or something like that. And then you can have people who are completely lost in their own inner world and can't even communicate, you know. Um, but I'm not trying to bl whatever the Sandy Hook kid did, I'm not trying to blame that on whatever illness he had. That kid, what he did was premeditated. Uh, you know, he was obviously filled with a lot of hate he wanted to kill. Um, but this guy, he left that manifesto on that site, Last Rhodesian or whatever it said. And typos and offensive content aside, I mean, it's actually fairly well written or well written enough where you can say this kid had at least an average, if not maybe slightly higher than average, IQ. But it goes to show that there's a difference between intelligence and wisdom. You know, someone can be book smart or they can be academically gifted, but they might be very ignorant in other ways in regards to maybe moral issues, in regards to uh, people's feelings and how to treat people, uh, just frankly, in matters of common sense. So that's the feeling I get when I read this kid's manifesto. He's not stupid, but just uh, profoundly uh, ignorant and misguided. And I'll read just a little bit from this kid's manifesto, not too much, because obviously, I mean, he doesn't deserve it. But see, so he says in one paragraph, I was not raised in a racist home or environment. Living in the South, almost every white person has a small amount of racial awareness simply because of the numbers of Negroes in this part of the country. But it is a superficial awareness. Growing up in school, the white and black kids would make racial jokes towards each other. Other, but all they were were jokes. Me and white friends would sometimes 
Yeah. And there's some, his, his writings kind of littered with uh, typos or whatever, but me and white friends would sometimes, and then there's a, a redundant would, watch things that would make us think that blacks were the real racist and other elementary thoughts like this, but there was no real understanding behind it. And then um, he says, then the event that truly awakened me was the Trayvon Martin case. I kept hearing and seeing his name, and eventually I decided to look him up. I read the Wikipedia article, and right away I was unable to understand what the big deal was. It was obvious that Zimmerman was in the right. Um, so you can see, I mean, I'm not saying that the kid is uh, some grand intellectual or gifted writer, but it's more than I expected from him. He can actually string sentences together and, and make a fairly uh, coherent paragraph. And obviously he has a kind of inner life where he really thinks about things a lot, etc. So it almost reminds me of that. You know, it's fine. I think most of us, when we're young, uh, generally, people think of idealism as a good thing. You know, it's good to have ideals. It's good to be idealistic. But there's a kind of idealism that we often embrace in our youth that makes us cringe when we look back on it later in life. And I'm guilty of that, too, where we discover maybe a new philosophy or a new worldview or some kind of cause or something like that and we embrace it whole hog and try to shove it down other people's throats and act in this really kind of overzealous way or whatever and it almost seems like this guy um just consumed a lot of racist garbage online and then um just drank that Kool-Aid and then became very idealistic about trying to act on uh, this ideology, this racist ideology he had uh, developed or discovered. And uh, the thing about, obviously, that's, a, well, it's offensive to me. I mean, the, the Zimmerman, the Trayvon Martin Zimmerman thing was a, a really hot button issue that stayed in the headlines for a long time. And uh, it was very controversial and, and divisive. And none of us were there, so none of us know exactly what happened that night. But I'll just say, frankly, I'm one of the people that leans towards the Trayvon Martin side. Because at the end of the day, it is true none of us know exactly what happened. I remember for a long time, no one knew who it was screaming on the audio recording. Was it Trayvon Martin screaming? Well, he was being kind of brutalized by George Zimmerman. Or was it George Zimmerman screaming for help after he had confronted Trayvon Martin and Trayvon Martin decided he was going to try to whoop him or whatever, you know? Um, and the last I heard, I, I think that was what people were tending to, to go to, that Zimmerman was armed, he approached Trayvon Martin, and uh, maybe Trayvon Martin wasn't going to be a little pushover, and he decided that if, if George Zimmerman was going to try to start something or get in his way, that he was going to kick his ass or something. And then maybe George Zimmerman realized he bit off more he could chew. And maybe he started to get his ass kicked by Trayvon Martin and then started screaming like a baby or whatever and, and ended up shooting the kid. But whatever you think happened with George Zimmerman and Trayvon Martin, the, the one thing that I always keep in mind at, at the end of the day, the one thing that always sways me in the end is that we had two people, Trayvon Martin and George Zimmerman. Trayvon Martin's father and uh, maybe his father's girlfriend or his, his uh, you know, Trayvon Martin's, uh, I think it was the father's girlfriend. I was almost going to say stepmother or something. But they lived in that neighborhood. And I don't know if it was some kind of gated or closed community or something like that. But Trayvon Martin had just bought Skittles and iced tea, I think it was, and he was on his way home because I think he was visiting his father. So you have a kid who's unarmed. He's got the Skittles, the iced tea. I, I think um, George Zimmerman tried to say that Trayvon Martin might have been be 
might have been behaving suspiciously and that maybe he was cutting through backyards and so he thought he might, you know, steal, was planning to try to steal something or break into a place or something like that. I, to be honest with you, it's been so long since I've looked at the facts of the case. I don't know if Trayvon Martin was cutting through backyards or not. I, I don't even remember. Um, but then when I think about when I was a kid and I was returning home from the, uh, from the town center, you know, from the conve- local convenience store, I would cut through people's yards, whatever way was the easiest to get back home, you know. But anyway, um, so yeah, an unarmed kid, still a high school student, I believe, just came back from the convenience store on the way home or to his father's house where he's staying. Then we have a grown ass man, George Zimmerman, um, who's in a car. And he's part of the neighborhood watch, I guess. And he seems to be the type of guy that likes to play cop. He he likes to... um, I mean, there is a Second Amendment, so, you know, you're allowed to carry a gun. Um, And there are, I I imagine, I hope, a lot of responsible gun owners out there, you know. So I'm not trying to disparage him just just because he was carrying a gun. But he does seem to be one of these guys that... Let's say he gets kind of a confidence boost from having a gun. And he, he had this kind of wannabe cop mentality. And he was in the car. He called the cops and the dispatcher. And supposedly people sympathetic to Zimmerman say, well, just because the dispatcher told him to stay in his car or not to engage the individual doesn't mean that he had to obey that. That wasn't, uh, you know, a, a legal uh, command from an officer or something like that. But I'm thinking, okay, even if it wasn't an officer you were talking to, you're talking to a dispatcher or whoever the heck it was, they t- took your complaint and they advised you that the smart thing to do was not to engage the person, not to get out of your car. So we have a young kid Once again, father lives in the neighborhood. As far as we know, he's just on his way home. We have a grown man in a car um, who could have stayed in that car and waited for the cops to arrive. But instead, he gets out. Somehow the two of them meet and Trayvon Martin ends up dead. So to me, if George Zimmerman had just kept his fat ass in the car and waited for the cops, there'd be a kid who had his whole life ahead of him still alive and we know that even after the fact trouble has just followed Zimmerman this guy cannot stay out of the news he cannot stay out of legal trouble he cannot stay out of getting trouble for how he uh, handles his firearms etc yeah but this kid's manifesto continues and he basically gives a breakdown of a bunch of different racial types or whatever he spends the most time talking about blacks and why he doesn't like them he tries to justify his feelings in kind of like a pseudo intellectual way or pseudo scientific way then he thinks jews are are really mostly white but he doesn't like them either he's a little bit more sympathetic for hispanics because he thinks a lot of them have white blood Really likes East Asians for some reason. I have great respect for the East Asian races. Even if we were to go extinct, they could carry something on. They are by nature very racist. (laughs) That's why I guess he likes them. And could be great allies of the white race. I am not opposed at all to allies with the Northern Asian races. Or maybe he means to being allied with the Northeast Asian races. And so obviously when you hear about a story like this, it makes you think about the concept of quote-unquote race. And I actually, I hate the term race, and I actually try not to use it. Because I think there are those basic, what I would call pseudo, or at least somewhat pseudoscientific racial classifications we're all probably familiar with, like uh, Caucasian, Negroid, Mongoloid, uh, etc., And I would say, what, maybe like in the 19th century, there was a lot of work where people tried to break races into, uh, or where people tried to divide humanity into different racial classifications. And it can be tricky because obviously there are superficial physical differences between different ethnic groups or whatever. And I think sometimes religious people try to demonize science 
as if it's all cold and empirical, which it is, which in a way it is, fortunately, and that's what we love about it. It's about facts, evidence, observation, you know. But also I think science can actually reinforce some of our moral insights. And I think a good example is race. You know, for a long time, racists want us to believe that people really were physiologically different and that some groups were subhuman or inferior to others. But even from, I was, I was going to say if they're religious, maybe they think that God, you know, designated these different racial uh, groups or whatever. But even that doesn't make sense because if you're a Christian, and often a lot of racist Christians are also fundamentalists who believe in the Bible literally, or at least believe in many prominent parts of the Bible, literally, like uh, Genesis and the story of Adam and Eve. So if the world started out with two people, aren't we all related despite our skin color? Uh, you know? Um, but anyway, but I think modern science through genetics has, has shown us that we really are one species. But then when you have isolated gene pools or you have groups that are living in disparate parts of the world, you know, over time, they do develop superficial physical traits, uh, say differences in eye and skin color and hair type that are kind of adaptations uh, to help one live uh, more ideally in, in their specific climate. For instance, uh, human life originated in Africa. And Africa, because of the extreme sun and heat, uh, it's more beneficial to have skin that's uh, dark and packed with melanin. Uh, and not only does melanin help protect us from the sun to some degree, but it's also what determines skin pigment. So you have people with dark skin. Uh, you have people with kind of tight, kinkier hair because it provides uh, a certain degree of ventilation, etc. And then when people migrated into Europe, uh, into the really, you know, the colder or cooler climes, you ended up with people who didn't need as much melanin in their skin. So you end up with a, a decreased amount of skin pigmentation, you end up with pe with people who have lighter eyes and, and hair and skin, and the hair doesn't need to be as kinky anymore um, to, to help cool the person off, to help cool the scalp off or whatever, so you end up with straighter hair. So there are these superficial differences, and sometimes there's genetic illnesses th that people of a specific group are more predisposed to, like uh, sickle cell with um, people of African descent, or Tay-Zachs with uh, Ashkenazi Jews, etc. But if you think about it, and uh, I know some people find this offensive, but since I love dogs, I don't, and I recognize the fact that we are animals. I like to use dogs as a good analogy. I have a chihuahua that's what, she's like 13 pounds, but she's fat. Uh, <laughs> she should be lighter or whatever. No, actually she's 16 pounds, but she's lost weight, but her, her target weight is 13 pounds. But chihuahuas can be much smaller than that. So, you know, you can have like a six pound chihuahua. Then you can have this gigantic, like Great Dane or Mastiff or, you know, or like Irish Wolfhound or something like that. And you can have these animals that look incredibly different, that they look like they don't even belong to the same species. But genetically, they are the same exact species. They might be predisposed to, to different hereditary illnesses because of overbreeding or, you know, because of isolated gene pools and, you know, small populations or whatever. And they, uh, they might have vastly different physical traits like a like a pushed-in pug nose compared to, say, the long wolfish snout of, like, a Doberman or a German Shepherd or something. Uh, and this is just because of breeding, too. But under the surface, they're the same species. And I think that's the same with humans, where we have these little differences in, in uh, superficial physical traits. Um, that we've developed over time because of isolated kind of gene pools or whatever. 
but underneath it, still the same exact species. And I think I once heard a scientist say, uh, now after getting that table leg thing wrong, I'm trying to watch what I say by quoting documentaries from, uh, or paraphrasing documentaries from memory, but something to the effect of that there's more differences genetically between two members of the same family than there are between two different quote-unquote racial groups or ethnic groups. That's how closely we're all related. Um, out of Africa, man, out of Africa. Um, so I'm just disgusted by these stories of, of racial hatred. And, and like I said, you know, um, I think in this, uh, want me to be nerdy and quote Dungeons and Dragons for a minute or whatever, but I remember when I was a little kid and I would play paper and pencil Dungeons and Dragons with the older kids in the neighborhood. Or it might have been when in high school, for a brief time, I think it was, I went back to playing Dungeons and Dragons. And I remember the popular kids who are, uh, who I was friends with kind of frowned on that, but hey, what are you gonna do? It was a fun game, man. And I still play D, uh, I still play DDO online even now. It's, it kind of reminds me of World of Warcraft, except it's Dungeons and Dragons. I was actually playing that this morning. How nerdy am I? But anyway, uh, there's a bunch of different attributes in Dungeons and Dragons when you're making a character, like strength, dexterity, charisma, things like that. And two of them are intelligence and wisdom. And they used to say that intelligence is knowing that it's raining. Wisdom is knowing to get out of the rain. And there I am quoting Dungeons and Dragons while trying to make a moral point. Um, but I actually think that's beautifully put in a way. And uh, it just goes to show that there is a difference between intelligence and wisdom. You know, you can have someone that is maybe book smart to a degree or they're not the uh, dullest knife in the draw, you know, like this kid here. Um, I don't know how much education he had or how well he did in school, but he was, he was relatively articulate and thoughtful. And I hate saying that because it sounds like I'm praising him. But he was also very ignorant and misguided and definitely didn't possess a lick of wisdom. And, and these racist types, it's like, I don't get it. As one person said on TV that uh, some of these people he killed, these nine black people, some of them most likely had ancestry that went back further in this country that went back further than his own because slaves arrived here so early. So it's like, I, I hate saying we, because one thing that I do kind of agree on is that there can sometimes be, and even I feel it sometimes, you know, the quote unquote white guilt, even though, like I said, uh, I'm mostly Italian, uh, um, like 50%, both my grandfathers were Italian. My grandmother's people were from County Cork, Ireland, um, which at the time, not not a very privileged place, uh, you know, and I, I'm not sure, but I would imagine that her family probably came here like many other Irish uh, to escape poverty or famine or whatever. And then I'm not sure of the exact ancestry of my other um, grandmother, but it might have been. Uh, like English and French Canadian. So who knows? Maybe if you dug far enough, you, enough, you might find some slaveholders. But I largely identify as Italian American and then Irish American. St. Patrick's Day is a fairly big thing in my family, as is Columbus Day. But so it's like most of my ancestors probably didn't come over here till like the Ellis Island period. You know, they weren't uh, they weren't slave owners. So sometimes I, I think there is a point when people talk about white guilt and how uh, that all of us, if we have white skin, are somehow guilty for the sins of the past in this country. But that being said, I use we generally speaking as an American um, and speaking as if we all own the past of this country as Americans, you know. So in that sense, you know, speaking kind of figuratively, whatever you can say, we dragged all these slaves here, and then what? Now you're not happy that they're here, so you're going to try to kill them all or drive them away? 
uh, and, and like the um, and, and like the, the good point that was made that I just referenced, when there's a lot of black people whose ancestry in this country predates that of a lot of uh, white Americans who might be, I don't know, they could be of German or, you know, Irish descent or whatever, people who immigrated after the uh, the colonization, uh, kind of like I was talking about in that um, Ellis Island period, or they could be Polish, they could be whatever. Yeah, so the whole racist thing, it just it doesn't make sense to me on so many different levels. It doesn't make sense morally. It doesn't make sense scientifically. And there's so th this stupid kid just threw his whole life away. I mean, what do you think he was going to prove murdering nine innocent people? And it's too bad the kid didn't get turned on to some more positive ideology. Or maybe that the kid didn't... Uh, wasn't exposed more to uh, basic facts about genetic science and uh, human evolution, where he'd be able to see that we are all the same species, Homo sapiens. But anyway, so, oh yeah, so here's where a, a kind of a religious element comes into play. So one thing that stuck with me, and maybe I heard it in the news today or yesterday, is that Already, already, man. I mean, like, or as maybe as early as like a day or two after this thing or whatever, some of the family members of some of the victims were already, you know, through tears and grief, saying that they forgive this guy and say, and are saying things like, you know, God have mercy on your soul, I forgive you, things like that. And it reminded me of uh, Hitchens, my hero, Christopher Hitchens. And I do. I don't call many people my hero, or refer to people as as, as heroes of of mine. And uh, some people, when when you call someone who actually didn't fight in a war or you know rescue a child from a burning building, will say, "Well, that's not a real hero." Uh, but I think you can have intellectual heroes, you know, or um, heroes who are activists or heroes who are thinkers or philosophers or, or whatever but christopher hitchens is one of my personal heroes for a number of reasons for his wit for his bravery and not being afraid to say what he thinks for his oratory skills for his sheer eloquence and his abilities as a uh, as a gifted writer i i don't think I and here I'm being a hypocrite because I often talk about how I don't want to be considered part of any specific community because I don't want to get kind of poisoned by groupthink. So I sometimes will even say that I don't even necessarily consider myself a part of any atheist community. But I'll be a bit of a hypocrite. And I'll say that I think that we non-believers, we atheists or whatever, we experienced a real loss when Hitchens passed, not just because someone that we loved and admired passed away, a real live human being, because a great kind of champion of the cause uh, passed away too. Um, I don't think there's any atheist speaker out there right now or free thought proponent or anything that's as charming, witty, intelligent, and has that unique ability to be simultaneously strident and eloquent at the same time, you know? There's no no one who can fill hitch and shoes uh, out there. You know, Matt Dillahunty and the rest of them, get out of here. But <laughs> I'm not taking that back. It's probably controversial. Who cares? No, it's, no one like Hitchens now. Um, but anyway, I mean, I think some of the other so-called horsemen are good, like uh, Dennett, Harris, Dawkins, of course. But none of them have the whole package like Hitchens did. Uh, as charming and as uh, witty as Dawkins can be, uh, he still doesn't... He has his own kind of je ne sais quoi, but he doesn't have the same je ne sais quoi that Hitchens had. Uh, but anyway, so, but anyway, so uh, back on topic. I remember, anyone who's a fan of Hitchens will remember this. He, in many of his talks, he used to say, he had this challenge. Name me one good deed or moral action that only a religious person could do that 
a non-believer couldn't. And he would, and then he would also say, think of an evil or wicked action that only a religious person could commit. And he'd kind of jokingly say to the audience, and, you know, I'm sure you've already thought of one. And what often comes to my mind is like human sacrifice. Um, you'd probably have to get really philosophical and uh, figurative <laughs> to try to say that atheists employ human sacrifice. People might bring up uh, like uh, maybe the war machine of a uh, communist government or something like that. But um, but anyway, so it made me think of Hitchens' challenge when I heard some of these people who had just lost their family members already forgiving the killer. And I was thinking that this impulse to forgive is probably largely fueled by religion, by Christian doctrine, you know, that you're supposed to forgive everyone or whatever, and that uh, eventually justice will be served through God or whatever. So this isn't to try to diminish them or or their kind of magnanimous attitude, which I do admire in a way. Um, but if you think about it, and here I am, as always, being overly analytical, I think at the end of the day, though, that response to forgive someone who did you or your or a loved one this heinous wrong you know this grotesque moral transgression uh in this case forgiving someone who took the life of your loved one i think although on the surface it seems to come from this place of divine generosity or grace or something like that when you think about it, I think at the end of the day, it's about catharsis. In a way, forgiving the person is kind of more about you than the person uh, you're forgiving. Because if you hold on to that anger, if you hold on to that hate, if you hold on to that pain, it'll just eat you up day after day and uh, emotionally destroy you, you know? Um, but, but I guess is that, well, I guess first off, is that a good act is forgiving someone who did something wicked, especially something of that caliber, murdering an innocent person? Is that good? I think at first blush, we think of it as good. And hopefully I'm not coming off as unsympathetic to the, uh, families of the victims because my sympathy is definitely with them. It sure as hell isn't with that kid who murdered, uh, nine innocent people, um, but I just think this is kind of an interesting topic to explore, and hopefully it's not, as they say, too soon, you know. But I remember thinking for a moment, I'm like, hmm, does this fit the criteria of the Hitchens Challenge? Could a secular person be so quick to forgive someone for such a heinous transgression? Um, is this the type of thing you could only do if you believe in God? You know, because if you believe in God, this big judge in the sky who's going to make sure everything works out in the end and that the bad people are punished, the good people are rewarded, you know, in, in the next life. You know, if you buy into that, if you buy into that, that it's God's job to judge uh, ultimately and not ours. So, you know, we should, we're all sinners, so we should forgive other people no matter how bad their sins are. There's all this theology tied up in that. Do you have to be a religious person to forgive some someone for their uh, transgressions? And is that a good, I don't know if it's a good thing uh, to forgive people for wicked acts. I think it's good. Good in a way for the victim and and or the and or the families of, of the victimized. Um, I think anything that helps a victim or their families pick up the broken pieces and somehow slog on and move forward with their lives is good. As someone whose heart breaks for victims, anything they can do to put their lives back together and, and move. I hate saying move on because moving on always, it, it seems to tacitly imply leaving, you know, the dead behind. Um, but I think, you know, you should, obviously I don't believe in life after death, but or I, I at least greatly doubt it. But 
I think we, you know, we should honor the dead and figuratively keep them with us. So in that sense, I never really liked the term move on, but, you know, be, be able to be a functional human being again. And if forgiving the monster that hurt you or your loved one or took their life helps you to move on, to move forward, then that's all right with me. Um, but is it a good thing morally? I don't know. It might be a good thing morally in the sense that it helps you find some measure of solace and and uh, remain functional for your remaining family, et cetera, you know? But could a secular person, could a non-believer like myself do the same thing? And I was giving this a lot of thought. And I think actually, you, I don't know if I could, but I think in theory a non-believer could. Because at the end of the day, like I was saying, I think it's about catharsis than it's more about catharsis than anything it's about um learning to let go of your anger and hate and grief enough to go on with life and uh so even someone who doesn't believe in a higher power who doesn't believe in some kind of cosmic justice you still might reach a point where you're like i don't like holding on to all this this anger and hate and resentment and I have to forgive the person that victimized me or that stole the life of my loved one and, uh, I don't know, maybe see them as a f fellow human being who did something awful, but be able to see the humanity in them, forgive them, and, and go on. I think a non-believer could do that. I don't know if I could. Um, and, you know, because I guess I, I largely tend to think of myself as someone who holds humanist values. But at the same time, I sometimes almost feel cavemanish because I still sometimes justify things like uh, capital punishment and uh, retribution and, and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Um, and, and that's actually something I, I almost set up another interview with anonymous steve it was almost going to take place this weekend but i think he had kind of a hectic weekend but uh and what i love about steve is that it doesn't matter how much we disagree about something we never get ugly or antagonistic about it i think as what i like to believe is two good-natured thoughtful individuals who also happen to have, you know, kind of silly senses of humor or whatever, you know, we're able to kind of happily explore any subject matter without taking it personally and wagging our fingers at one another. And I, I really love that. I, I think people, even if they have opposing viewpoints, should be able to explore those ideas enthusiastically and with a kind of good-natured zest instead of turning it into a pissing match or getting angry with one another. But Steve and I disagree to some degree with capital punishment. Um, I know that. But, oh, this time around, actually, now that I think about it, it was, it was the use of the word terrorist. Um, I'm pretty much pro-use of the word terrorist. I just think it's a, basically an apt descriptor at the end of the day. And if jackasses at, like, Fox News use it in a racist way or they use it out of context... Um, we should hold them accountable for that, but that doesn't mean that we have to ban the word from the lexicon. If we got rid of every word that um, other people use incorrectly or unjustly, you know, we'd be shedding words all the time or whatever. Um, I think terrorist is a good description for someone that commits an act of for someone that commits an act of violence against innocents, you know, in the name of religion or political agenda with the goal of kind of frightening or demoralizing the other side, blowing up bombs in a public place, um, sawing the heads off of bound hostages, uh, threatening the lives of cartoonists. That's that's terrorism to me. Um, I don't care what the religion or ethnicity uh, in, involved is. It, it's terror. It's terrorism, just like uh, bombing an abortion cl clinic is uh, 
an act of terrorism, just like Timothy McVeigh and the Oklahoma bombing, then that's terrorism. But I know Steve and I differ on that. He thinks that terrorism is kind of a conversation stopper. And, you know, it's just this kind of inflammatory word uh, that doesn't do anyone any good. And what I love about Steve is the way that even if I don't necessarily see eye to eye with him, he's able to deliver his opinion in such a thoughtful and intelligent and rational way that you almost want to see it from his way, even if you don't, because it, it can sometimes be hard to argue with his his reason uh, or, or his, his sense of, of logic on, on these uh, issues. But what the hell was I talking about? Oh, yeah, the death penalty. My main issue with the death penalty is that there's always the grotesque possibility of an innocent person being put to death. And and usually we want to put someone to death for committing some almost unspeakable atrocity. Like if it's the... Uh, I always use the Pettit family from Connecticut as an example. And I don't want to go through it in gruesome detail again, but this was a family that was victimized in just about every way possible, uh, resulting in the death, the burning alive of the two daughters and the mother. So often when we talk about wanting to put someone to death, it's for committing some type of moral atrocity, you know? And, uh, but I think another absolutely heinous, almost unspeakable moral atrocity would be accidentally putting an innocent man to death. And that's why I think we have to be so careful when it comes to capital punishment. And uh, it's kind of scary when you hear about these people who've been sitting on death row. And luckily for them, you know, new DNA evidence turns up or new uh, some other type of evidence turns up that vindicates them before they actually, you know were brought to the gas chamber or the electric chair or, you know, strapped down for a lethal injection or whatever. I mean, but the people who raped and murdered, you know, the Pettit family, only, you know, the husband was left alive. The, the, the two daughters, one of the daughters, the younger of the two was raped. The mother was raped. The father was beaten and chained to a pole in the basement. And then the, uh, the house was set on fire with the uh, the mother and the two daughters inside, and very very sadly, uh, they didn't they didn't make it. Uh, so I would totally be for, but like, let's say we knew with one hundred percent certainty, like I think we do with these two guys, the two guys that committed that crime. We know they did it, you know. If you know with one hundred percent certainty that someone committed an atrocity like that. I would. I have no problem putting those guys to death. Would I be able to personally put them to death? Would if if I was there getting ready to pull the 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 metaphorical switch or the <laughs> or literally pull the switch, depending on what type of you know execution we're talking about? Would I look at them and suddenly, no matter how small, see some spark of uh, humanity in them that that made me second guess my willingness to uh, put them to death? I don't know. But at least as an armchair philosopher, the idea of people being put to death for crimes like that doesn't bother me. But if, if we had the vote on the death penalty, you know, I would give seriously thought to I would give serious thought to voting against it just because I was so concerned about the idea of an innocent person being put to death. But, you know, in principle, I don't have a problem with with someone as I sit here today being put to death for some kind of uh atrocity like that um but yeah it does give you pause because as a human being you realize even if you're just philosophizing on a podcast you realize the weight the responsibility that your words carry when you're either even just talking on a little podcast like this about when someone should or shouldn't be put to death by the government. I mean, that's heavy stuff, you know? And that reminds me of how, you know, I live in the greater Boston area. On a good day, I could I can reach the city of Boston in probably 15 minutes or less if the, you know, if the, the traffic on the highway is clear or whatever. Um, and what was it, a few weeks back, not only did they find uh, Jokar Zanayev, one of the brothers 
who committed the uh, Boston Marathon bombing or perpetrated it, uh, whatever. I think the rum's getting to me. Um, but uh, shortly after, the jury voted for the death penalty. And I remember I was kind of hoping he would get the death penalty. I mean, I just despise the two of these guys so bad, I probably can't even say some of the things I had kind of fantasized about happening to them because people would want to lock me up in a loony bin or call me some kind of wild sadist or something. But then I remember when they announced it on the news, when you hear this loud, sober voice on the local news saying, sentenced to death, you're like, whoa, just got real. The the state or whatever, the government's going to actually kill someone. And then I remember what he did. I remember they put the pressure cooker bombs down on the ground where they would tear off, you know, um, scores of limbs or whatever. And they uh, it might have been Joe Karzanayev that put the pressure cooker down that, uh, you know, in the backpack or whatever that killed the young boy. Uh, Three people died. A a little boy died. I think he was like eight or something. And and I feel bad uh, out of the you know, of respect for the families and the victims that maybe I'm not remembering correctly from memory. But uh, it's kind of sad. I just took up my iPad and started uh, typing in Boston Marathon into uh, the Wikipedia app um, on here. And before I was even done typing Marathon, the first thing that comes up, you know, Boston Marathon bombing. Or one of the first things. Okay, so here it is. Three spectators were killed in the bombing. Crystal Marie Campbell, 29, a restaurant manager from Medford, Massachusetts. And I'm often in Medford, Massachusetts. It's actually one of my brothers lives, and we do a lot of uh, work there, Um, you know, doing uh, construction and things like that. Lu Ling Zi. 23, a Chinese national and Boston University graduate student from Shenyang. And Martin William Richard, an eight, I was right, eight year old boy from Dorchester neighborhood of Boston, from the Dorchester neighborhood of Boston, who was killed by the second bomb. On April 18th, at about 10.48 p.m., Sean A. Collier, 27, an MIT police officer, formerly with the Somerville Auxiliary Police Department. I actually used to live in Somerville. Um, and he was of Wilmington, Massachusetts. And uh, I actually know people from Wilmington. And uh, he was living in Somerville at the time. But then I bring it back. And like I said, when you hear this loud, sober voice on the radio saying someone's just been sentenced to death, it's it's heavy. You know, you, 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 a fellow human being is going to be put to death. But then when I remember who that excuse for a human being is and what they did, then I still feel the weight of it. That is a part of that is a part of a society. You know, when you look at, at a society as a whole, um, that we've decided we're going to put someone to death for doing something wicked. I don't necessarily have a problem with it. And when I hear about people who commit these wicked acts, that's what my mind kind of goes towards. Now that's someone who deserves the death penalty. But you still feel the moral weight of the de- of the decision. You know. But anyway, I can't believe I've been at this for almost two hours now. My guess is, going by experience, by the time that I trim this down, we're probably looking at an hour and a half long episode. So I will call it quits for now. Yep, Facebook, Twitter, uh, subscribe or rate the show through iTunes. Um, go to Podbean, look for The Week in Doubt, check out the archives going all the way back to the first episode. You can also donate to the show via PayPal at Podbean. And now Podbean has this big green patron button, too. It's kind of like Patreon, but it's right within Podbean. So if you'd like to become a patron and donate to the show... You can do that. And who knows? Maybe I should set up a goal there for, like, equipment or something. Uh, You can also donate to the show via Patreon. If you're already a Patreon uh, supporter or whatever, don't feel like you have to do both Podbean and Patreon. One is more than fine, and I'm so grateful to you guys whenever you help in any way. So let's see. I think that's it for now. So until next week, thanks for listening.